May it please the Court, my name is Jay O'Keefe. I represent Henry Lewis, and I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. A jury found that the City of Alexandria fired Mr. Lewis for trying to stop violations of the Virginia Fraud Against Taxpayers Act. The question presented is what relief he's entitled to as a result under the Act's anti-retaliation provision. That provision creates a cause of action unknown in common law. It protects whistleblowers and ensures that they'll be made whole. In fact, that's the Act's first remedial principle. And when the General Assembly was explaining how these protections would work, it used mandatory language. Any employee retaliated against shall be entitled to all relief necessary to make him whole, and that relief shall include certain items such as reinstatement and special damages. And it's those items that we're here to discuss today. When the jury found that the City had fired Mr. Lewis illegally, it awarded him back pay, but the trial court reserved for itself the question of what other relief was required to make him whole under the Act. Mr. Lewis asked for reinstatement or front pay plus compensation for his lost pension, but the trial court didn't. Counsel, was it error for the court to do that? In other words, was it appropriate for the court to make that determination within its equitable jurisdiction rather than leave it to the jury? I don't believe it was error, Your Honor. I believe it was appropriate for the court to bifurcate those two issues, let the jury decide the back pay issue, but let the trial court decide issues of front pay, reinstatement, and the other equitable remedies. And if we were to determine that either front pay or reinstatement is in fact required based upon the statute, and it went back to the circuit court, and the circuit court were to determine that there is one month of front pay, which is shown by the facts based upon the police station construction project being over in October and the termination being in September, would that be error for the court? It probably would. On this record, it would be a clear error of judgment, but it would be within the court's discretion to make a finding based on the facts of the case and the statutory framework. So the trial court would be much closer to doing something that was appropriate in your hypothetical. I believe on the facts as they were established at trial, it would still be inappropriate and that Mr. Lewis has established his right to some amount of front pay in excess of one month of front pay. But if the court were to find one month and it were to come back up to us, it would be on an abuse of discretion standard, would it not? It would, and in fact, it arguably could even be on a fact-finding standard. We could be challenging fact findings that supported that exercise of its discretion. So if this goes back down and the trial court makes those determinations, the trial court will be in a much stronger place on any subsequent appeal than it is right now. Because as far as we can tell from the record, all the trial court did was look at this request and say, almost categorically, that front pay and lost pension damages were speculative, so they're out of the picture. And then, Mr. Lewis, you've been made whole by the other relief you've gotten, which is double back pay, about $8,000 of lost vacation pay, and expungement of his record. And we think that was an abuse of discretion for two major reasons. The first being that the Act says a successful plaintiff is entitled to reinstatement and special damages. And reinstatement is the preferred statutory remedy, but as courts have recognized, it's also inherently equitable, and trial courts need some discretion to determine that it might not be practical. The working relationship between the parties may have soured, somebody might have a new job, so front pay is available as a substitute or complement. But as courts have also recognized, every award of front pay is speculative. It's inherent in the nature of the award. So on the trial court's logic in this case, no award of front pay could ever be appropriate, and on the facts of this case, no amount of front pay could ever be appropriate, because it would always be speculative. And that's a classic abuse of discretion, because the trial court gave dispositive weight to an improper factor in the statutory analysis. The question isn't whether front pay or lost pension damages in the abstract are speculative, because they are, just like any other award of lost pension damages, or future lost damages. The real question is whether on the facts of this case, and in the context of the statute that explicitly authorizes prospective relief, they were unduly or impermissibly speculative, and the record shows that they weren't. Counsel, actually what the trial court says is on page 920 and 921, right? I mean, that's the ruling on this issue. That's right, Your Honor. And you interpret that to be a legal ruling, not a factual ruling. That's correct, Your Honor, but it's wrong either way, and we can get into the facts as well. But what the trial court says is, I'll tell you I just 
I think that the front pay issues, as well as the pension, are simply too subject to too much speculation for me to make an award with regard to front pay or pension. And that's the sum total of its ruling. So that it's either a categorical ruling that these categories of awards are, are subject to too much speculation, so they're out of bounds under the Fraud Against Taxpayers Act, or it's a fact finding that uh, on the facts of this case, these, these awards are subject to too much speculation. If it's the former, it's clearly wrong because it excises a whole category of relief that, that the General Assembly made available. If it's the latter, it's still wrong because here are the key facts in the case. Mr. Lewis was near retirement. He was 58 years old at the time of trial. He held a senior management level position at the city that wasn't limited to a specific term and it wasn't limited to a specific project. He planned to work at the city until he was 65. But, counsel, the facts show that he was, he was hired in that senior management position with the title of project manager for a single project, was he not? Not exactly, Your Honor. Um, he was hired, and his offer letter is in the record. Um, what, what page? I, let's see. 112. And it's not limited to a specific project, and it's not limited to a specific term. He's offered the position of senior project manager in the capital projects division of the Department of General Services. Now, it may well be the case that the reason he was offered that position was because there was a massive new project coming up. Did he work on any other project? No, and when he was um, he was hired before the conclusion of this project, and when he, when he was he was fired before the conclusion of the project, and when he was hired, he was given um, several alternative projects to work on, and he picked this one. So it was just a matter of timing. Does the record show whether anyone um, else uh, was anyone was hired in his place to do with his title and his salary or something akin to it after his termination? In other words, was his position refilled? I don't think the record is clear on that, but I think that the project was completed shortly after his termination. So, I'd be but, but again, your argument is that he wasn't hired on a project-specific basis. And that's so right. that's why it would be important to know whether the record shows whether the position went unfilled because, in fact, it was a project-specific position or whether he was replaced indicating that, it, that, in fact, there was a need for a senior project manager independent of whether the police station was finished or not. And, and that, would, that is an important fact that the record is not clear on, but there are other important facts that the record is clear on. And, and one of the key facts is that his pension was going to vest on January 1, 2013, less than 16 months after he's fired. So he had every financial incentive to stay at least that long. And the record, so far as it, as it deals with his performance, gives us every reason to think that he would. First of all, Mr. Lewis isn't an employee at will who can be fired at any time for any reason. He's entitled to civil service protections as a city employee. And he's also only able to be fired for cause and pursuant to applicable grievance procedures. He'd received only outstanding performance evaluations during his time at the city, and that was the highest possible rating. And even some of the defense witnesses that the defense called at trial had kind things to say about his professional but competence. Does the record reflect whether he, the, the conclusion of any grievance proceed, proceeding that he initiated? Uh, the, the termination was ultimately upheld. I'm not sure if the record reflects the specific conclusion of the grievance proceeding, or I, but the termination was upheld. So, okay. yeah. Counsel, what was the discussion about the performance appraisal that was written, arguably, <coughs> or at least according to one of their witnesses, uh, Mr. Lewis didn't like it. They allowed him to rewrite it, and they signed off on it. I only see, if I recall, one performance appraisal that's duplicated in here, and there was some discussion in the uh, testimony that there was a performance appraisal that was written, uh, it wasn't to your client's liking, they allowed him to rewrite it. I, I think there are actually two uh, performance evaluations. They look to be the same one to me, I could be wrong, they I could be for different time frames, but I thought they were the same one. Um, but I think the discussion was essentially just that, that uh, the defense testimony is that one of the performance evaluations uh, was based on a self-evaluation or, or input from Mr. Lewis, but the point is that the jury heard all these facts and decided on the basis of all these facts that Mr. Lewis was fired illegally for trying to stop violations of the Fraud Against Taxpayers Act, and that's the, the starting point of the trial court's analysis. Um, the, the jury already heard these facts and decided in Mr. Lewis's favor. Um, on the specific point of the lost pension, I, I do want to 
emphasized that that pension was going to vest, you know, 16 months after Mr. Lewis's termination and actually before the date of trial. So to the extent that the trial court's saying on these facts that the lost pension damages are speculative, that's fundamentally inconsistent with the jury's award of back pay. The jury's already found as a fact that Mr. Lewis was entitled to a certain amount of back pay through trial. And for the trial court to say that pensions, a pension that would have vested before then is impermissibly speculative can't be reconciled with the jury's finding that Mr. Lewis was entitled to that back pay. But um, even if the trial court had determined that a seven-year award of front pay and, and lost pension damages was impermissibly speculative, and, and we think that ruling would be a mistake for all the reasons that we've discussed today and also the cases we cite on brief that award much longer periods of front pay, uh, the trial court had tools at its disposal to mitigate any uncertainty. It could have awarded front pay for a lesser period. It could have um, adjusted the discount rate. It could have awarded the pension benefits just through trial, as both Mr. Lewis and the city pointed out in their post-trial briefing. It could have looked to Mr. Lewis's duty to mitigate or the fact that he obtained subsequent employment, but it did none of those things. And so we argue that the trial court's ruling on that point was an abuse of discretion, but it compounded that error by making a second independent mistake when it found that double back pay, expungement, and vacation pay alone made Mr. Lewis whole for purposes of the act. Now, that's an abuse of discretion, and it's wrong for two reasons. It's wrong as a matter of fact, and it's wrong as a matter of law. As a matter of fact, the jury found that Mr. Lewis risked and lost his job to protect city taxpayers from violations of the Fraud Against Taxpayers Act. As a result, the jury found that he suffered back pay damages of $104,000, and the uncontested evidence at trial was that Mr. Lewis lost, suffered prospective damages of about $230,000. He got an award of double back pay plus about $8,000 for lost uh, vacation time. So that covered less than half of his uncontested future loss damages. So as a matter of simple arithmetic, he wasn't made whole. But the trial court made a deeper legal mistake in that ruling because it didn't consider all the statutory factors. Um, the General Assembly says that an employee shall be made whole, and then it says what that relief shall include. And when the statute used shall in that context, it uses shall in, in its mandatory meaning. And we know that both from the subject matter and the context of the language. First, uh, in terms of the context, the Act's anti-retaliation provision is a remedial statute. It comes up in the context of the Fraud Against Taxpayers Act, a statute whose enforcement mechanisms all depend on whistleblowers coming forward to report violations, and which is therefore very protective of those whistleblowers. The specific anti-retaliation provision, 801.216.8, uses the word shall eight times. Two of those are at issue here. The other six are un incontrovertibly mandatory uses. They're talking about jurisdiction. Um, so the General Assembly and the drafters of this statute knew the difference between shall and may, and when they said shall in this context, they were talking about shall in the mandatory sense. In effect, the General Assembly has stipulated as to what will make an employee whole under this statute and, and said what those elements include, and the trial court was bound by that legislative determination. It was still free to exercise some discretion, but only so long as it stayed within the statutory framework. Now, we cited federal appellate cases for the proposition that some of this language in the Federal False Claims Act is mandatory. I want to highlight one more case that deals with the FMLA, the FMLA provision that says that an employer who violates uh, that statute shall be liable for prejudgment interest, among other things. In Dotson against Pfizer Incorporated, 558 F3rd 284 302, uh, the Fourth Circuit found, essentially, in accordance with our agreement, in effect, when Congress said shall, Congress has stipulated as to what will make a wronged employee whole under the FMLA, and we're bound by that legislative decision. I emphasize that because that's Dotson, the city of Alexandria's single best case, the single case that cites more than any other case in its brief, and it not only advances but applies our theory of the case. So for all those reasons, we'd ask the court to reverse the trial court's judgment and remand the case for further proceedings in accordance with the Fraud Against Taxpayers Act. Thank you. Thank you. and may it please the court. My name is Jonathan Mook, and I'm here on behalf of the city of Alexandria. Uh, we submit, Your Honors, that the circuit court appropriately exercised its discretion in determining that Mr. Lewis was not entitled to his post-judgment request for front pay uh, for nine years following his termination 
or pension benefits through age 80. In light of let, me, let me go right yeah. back to the question that I asked. Independent of whether he asked, he asked for too much, as, a, as an initial matter, when it has been found that the Fraud Against Taxpayers Act has been violated, how can one ignore the shall? How can one say, I will neither reinstate you to the job that you were wrongfully terminated from, or in lieu of reinstatement, I will give you some front pay, be it one day, one month, or several years? Your Honor, two answers to that, or two, two, two responses. First is, when the word shall is a list of available remedies that are um, that a court or a jury may impose uh, as damage remedies to make an individual whole. Certainly, uh, if those remedies um, in conjunction would be more than what would make an individual whole. C counsel, let me then rephrase the question. When it has been found that one has violated the Fraud Against Taxpayers Act through a wrongful termination, how can it be that either reinstatement or some aspect of front pay is not required to make that individual whole? We're talking about a wrongful termination. That is a finding of fact in this case that is not being challenged. Correct, Your Honor. But... First of all, front pay is not mentioned in that list. Again, that's in lieu of reinstatement. But and, and, and both and and the the there are numerous cases indicating that front pay can be in lieu of reinstatement. There are some federal district courts interpreting the um, uh, False Claims Act, mm -hmm. uh, which have said that. Uh, there's been no circuit court decisions in the federal courts of appeals interpreting the False Claims Act uh, to but allow it, under not only False Claims Act but other employment discrimination statutes. The the, the cases are legion. Yeah, th that is correct, Your Honor. But but again, under again, the how, how can how can wholeness not include either reinstatement or front or or front pay in lieu of reinstatement? Well, two points, Your Honor. First of all, that if a showing of front pay is uh, unduly speculative in terms of its calculation and in terms of the assumptions that have been made uh, for seeking front pay, then a court could deny an award of front pay as being unduly speculative uh, because, of course, a court should not award speculative damages. They need to be proved with reasonable certainty. Second of all, Your Honor, uh, because the statute allows for two times an award of back pay, that is an additional amount that needs to be taken into consideration in terms of the calculus as to whether or not a plaintiff should be entitled to... Um, where, where in the statutory language or the statutory history or our case law or any case law does it indicate that a liquidated amount for back pay is in lieu of some future damages? What, 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 is, the, what is the basis for that argument? Your Honor, that the two are not equated the same, but in making the, the, the touchstone for relief under the Fraud Against Taxpayers Act is to make a plaintiff whole for the injuries that the plaintiff suffered. Uh, that is, that's the touchstone, and there are available remedies that are set forth in the statute in order to make the plaintiff whole. But if in awarding certain remedies the plaintiff is going to be made more than whole, then those remedies um, should not be awarded because the plaintiff is then going to get a windfall. In this instance, though, the judge did not say, I am not going to reinstate or give front pay because I have given back pay. Is that correct? Uh, the judge, uh, in his ruling, stated that he um, determined that Mr. Lewis had been made whole as a result of the relief that was awarded in the case. 
which was the um, the double back pay, uh, the uh, giving him his accrued leave, uh, the um, injunctive relief that was given with respect to his employment record and the award of attorney fees. That the court determined that that award, which had um, been uh, either made by the jury or by the court in its equitable powers, was sufficient to make Mr. Lewis whole. And therefore, the court determined that any additional award would not be necessary to make Mr. Lewis whole. And in addition, that the relief that Mr. Lewis was requesting in the form of not only front pay, but his uh, future pension benefits, was um, unduly speculative uh, for purposes uh, of an award under the Fraud Against Taxpayers Act. So, so the court did make a determination that, he, that the, the, the uh, amount that was awarded to Mr. Lewis would make him whole, which Count, is the, the, the you, standard under the statute. You have answered that question. Thank you. I have one additional question. Okay. And, 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 I have yes. one additional question. Yes. Assuming rather than a grievance, an employee who has a grievance procedure that he can follow, Assume an employee who is at will, where one cannot show a right to employment for even one additional day. Would front pay for an at will employee always be speculative, based upon your argument? No, Your Honor. I believe you need to look at the factual context of the case, which is what this court did. The court sat through through the entire. But if the factual time. context shows that the employer rightfully could terminate the person for good cause, bad cause, or no cause at all, a day after reinstatement, then how could damages not be speculative? Your Honor, I believe that in a, it's, which is a different circumstance in this case. I understand. Of course, it's, it's a hypothetical, uh, but that, that, that's, where the, argument, the that's nature, where the argument forces us to go. Correct, Your Honor. Depending upon the nature of the employment relationship, if it's a long-term employment relationship uh, that the employee uh, uh, otherwise um, had been uh, performing uh, well. Uh, that there was a good relationship with the employer, but for some specific improper reason, that was the basis for the termination. Uh, a court might decide that um, using those factors in terms of awarding front pay, or if you had a situation where the employee uh, was not a particularly good employee, uh, that there had been acrimony uh, between the employer and the employee, uh, during a significant period of time. In that situation, the court may decide that particularly because the employee was at will, that no front pay should be awarded. Uh, and again, in terms of that assessment of the award of reinstatement or front pay, here in this case, the judge made the determination about the degree of acr acrimony between the city of Alexandria and Mr. Lewis that um, was the deciding factor as to why the court did not award reinstatement, and that was agreed to by both um, Mr. Lewis and the city as being an accurate assessment of the situation. And I think it's, it's important to point out that the degree of acrimony which the court referenced in its ruling is not necessarily one that had to be caused by any purported activity by Mr. Lewis uh, under the Fraud Against pa Taxpayers Act. Uh, the standard as tried to the jury was not Mr. Lewis was terminated solely because of his um, uh, actions uh, protesting or having some complaints about various invoices being submitted. Uh, it only had to be a factor. It didn't have to be the sole factor. So there were other factors involved in terms of Mr. Lewis's employment history and only three years of employment history with the city that the judge certainly could take into account in finding the, dis the degree of acrimony uh, necessitated a determination that reinstatement would not be uh, appropriate here. And a question earlier was raised uh, by the court about uh, any evidence in the record about the a grievance proceeding that Mr. Lewis had, been, had filed and what was the uh, result of that grievance proceeding. And uh, in the joint appendix on pages 211 through 228, 
there is the determination by the assistant city manager of holding the termination of mr lewis on four separate grounds including the failure failure to maintain a harmonious working relationship with co-workers and supervisors and so again there is evidence in the record as to the level of acrimony between mr lewis and the city irrespective of any actions or any that he may have taken that might have found protection under the virginia fraud against taxpayers act particularly with respect to this issue of the award of front pay in lieu of reinstatement and a situation where you have double damages award i think reference to the the dotson case by my learned counsel is appropriate to take a look at that case because in that case the court determined that in light of and this was a case under the fmla liquidated damages being awarded the fact that the employee in that case had obtained alternative employment in three years making sixty five thousand dollars less in the new job in terms of pay and benefits that liquidated i'm sorry front pay would not be awarded in that case because doubling the back pay the amount of liquidated damages was sufficient to make that employee whole under the fmla so here you do have a case where even though under the fmla reinstatement is an available remedy it is recognized that front pay in lieu of reinstatement is an available remedy uh the court uh the fourth circuit held that in light of the liquidated damages being awarded that um front pay should not be awarded in that case so i think that is instructive in terms of this court's reasoning as to the analysis and the calculus of the various factors uh and the various types of relief that may be awarded because as i said the touchstone is to make the employee whole now now one last point about explanation about looking at fmla cases or ada adea cases or um flsa cases that have been cited in both parties briefs one factor to consider is that some courts and it's been pointed out by mr lewis's counsel uh have stated that um an award of liquidated damages should only play a small role in terms of the calculus of determining whether or not an employee has um been given make whole relief uh and that is because under those statutes uh fmla flsa age discrimination act the view of liquidated damages is based on a willful finding of a violation of the statute is in the nature of punitive damages it is discretionary to award liquidated damages under all three of those federal statutes and it is in the nature of a punitive damages here your honor punitive damages not awarded by the jury there was no finding of willfulness uh on the part of the city to the extent of an award of punitive damages um and that in this type of a situation the statute says automatically it is double two times the amount of back pay so to the extent that there are some federal cases interpreting those federal statutes uh declining to uh offset uh an award of liquidated damages against front pay that's because liquidated damages is viewed as punitive and therefore you shouldn't have an offset here we don't have that situation your honor we have an automatic doubling of back pay absent any finding of punitive damages so again i think it counsels in favor of what the judge did here which is that of viewing the situation and viewing the facts in this case an award of double back pay and the other types of award that the court um awarded in this case that that was sufficient to make mr lewis whole and in doing so properly exercised its discretion thank you thank you rebuttal
four quick points, Your Honors. Um, first, to Justice Nim's question, Mr. Lewis ended his administrative proceeding on his grievance on his own accord after the hearing before the uh, uh, city manager. He could have brought it to an arbitration before three neutral arbitrators, but he decided not to. Second, to Justice Powell's question, um, Mr. Lewis had two performance reviews. They came out at the same time, but they were for two different time periods, and you can see that at JA 116 and 128. Third, with regard to the FMLA and ADA, ADEA, the language in those statutes is much more flexible than the language in the Fraud Against Taxpayers Act. It lets the trial court grant such relief as may be appropriate, except for a few items of relief like prejudgment interests that are mandatory. So those courts have much more flexibility to consider um, different elements in determining what relief may be appropriate. They don't have to, if it, there's not the shall grant such relief. And fourth, the reason that liquidated damages play only a minor role in deciding if uh, somebody's been made whole it is not because they're punitive necessarily, but as Judge Posner explains in uh, Price versus Marshall Erdman, because we need to make sure that the wrong plaintiff is fully compensated. Thank you.